So, so my background, I'm, I'm a mathematician, um, so I'm an applied mathematician who's kind of come through the classical, you know, sort of applied mathematics UK training. So I work predominantly in sort of continuum mechanics and math developing mathematical methods to understand the real world and you know, the world around us to, to a great extent. So the talk today is sort of the culmination of, of the last few years of work. Um, and it, well, I guess some of it dates back sort of 20 years ish to when I started do my PhD but when I was doing my PhD I was mainly just interested in theory and had my sort of mathematician goggles on and was just thinking about methods and obviously as you sort of develop um, you know you get interested in other things and in particular I've become very interested over the last 10 years in bringing things together so pulling things together so I wasn't comfortable in sort of just and I don't mean just in a, in a negative way but just doing mathematics but I wanted to work with people in order to sort of think about um, experimental methods and materials development and trying to characterize materials and, and all the sort of plethora of things that you, you can do. So I've been fortunate to work with some really fantastic people um, along that road. So um, some of these people are listed here. So um, Matt's a current postdoc of mine, Parmish was a postdoc last year, um, Prasad Potler is a, a professor of material science at Manchester. Mike was a postdoc of mine and is now a postdoc in Cambridge. And Zeshan is a current postdoc. And Gareth Wynne Jones is a lecturer in mathematics. So this is just essentially to sort of tell you about some of the work that we've been, we've been doing. Sort of more generally, this is our group in Manchester. Um, so we call it the Mathematics of Waves and Materials group because it sort of does what it says on the tin. Um, we investigate sort of canonical scattering problems, multiple scattering problems in complex materials. We work on metamaterials, that sort of stuff. And then we sort of work over with um, soft materials, so biological tissues, um, and develop what we think of as some nonlinear composites. So, you know, it, it has a more interesting stress strain relationship than linear, essentially. Um, and so, you know, we, we do things ranging from the very, very theoretical to the very, very applied, which I think is, is important. So, to sort of illustrate this with one very simple example, you know, we do mass with the strong, uh, strong ion applications. So this is some of the work we did with Dyson, which is about developing acoustic metamaterials. Um, and essentially, this is just to look at, you know, how can you slow down sound? You know, why do you want to do that? Well, that's to come shortly, but you want to slow down sound in order to have some control of, of acoustics. And what we managed to do was sort of design microstructures. They're just ellipses, really. But the important thing is that you impedance match to air, but you also slow down sound. So essentially this is the theoretical wave speed the slope is what's important here for uh, uh, the wave speed in air and, and by designing this microstructure appropriately then we impedance match to air which is important in terms of getting energy into the system but we also um, half the wave speed okay and why this is important is because if you're trying to design something like a resonator which which stops wave propagation for example you're limited at low frequencies and so it just in air so an empty resonator will will resonate here at sort of two kilohertz, for example, whereas with our microstructured resonators, they now resonate at uh, one kilohertz. Okay, so, so you've kind of, you've reduced that um, resonant frequency just by thinking about the kind of microstructure that you can have in your system. So, you know, the, this illustration was just to say that, you know, we use mathematics in the actual understanding of how the wave propagates in this structure, okay, in order to, you know, we use homogenization, thinking about what the effective sound speed is and that sort of thing. But it has an eye on the application in the sense that this can now be used potentially in a system where you're thinking about compact resonance. Okay, so what are we interested in uh, more broadly? And what I'm gonna talk about here is syntactic foams. So this may be a term that you haven't heard of before, but it's basically a metal polymer or ceramic matrix with either plastic or glass microspheres. Okay, so these are, uh, hollow spherical shells and, and you introduce those in order to tailor the properties of the material um, and you can get very nice acoustic, thermal, electronic and um, elastic properties um, by introducing different types of materials into different matrices and because they're hollow you end up with a, a really really um, massive reduction in weight okay so you get a um, nice property whilst also having a lightweight structure which is obviously um, useful and it's finding increasing applications in things like marine and aerospace, sportswear and automotive and um, I can't remember which one now but one of the footballs at one of the World Cups had um, syntactic foams in them. I, I never remember which one but 
wasn't very successful, I don't think, actually, but, but there you go. So, so back in the day where we were actually allowed to sort of be in the same room with people, we had a workshop uh, in Manchester in October 2019. It seems a lot longer ago than sort of 18 months, I can't really believe it, or 19 months. Um, it seems bizarre that we were actually allowed to, to be sort of together, and I hope we can do that sort of thing again. But we had quite a small scale workshop um, with about 40 people, which just, just focused on syntactic poems. And um, it was a really fantastic event. Um, and there's been lots of follow on and there was going to be more follow on. But obviously, COVID happened to prevent that. Um, what we're predominantly interested then is in, in then is to, to sort of think about how syntactic foams um, compress, for example, under load. So, for example, if you have a foam that has a 40 percent filler, OK, or a 0% filler, how does the stress strain curve look? Okay, and you see what happens is that by adding microspheres, then you increase the initial stiffness. So, you know, the, this stress strain curve is, is steeper in this instance, but then subsequently you get this kind of softening effect. Okay, so why does that happen? Um, we'll talk about that in a moment, but this kind of effect is, is pretty classical in syntactic foam. So you have this initial stiffness, then a softening, and then when you get to a very, very high strain regime, you get sort of a densification. And, and that's essentially associated with the microspheres. OK, so for glass microspheres in this regime, then under compression, the glass microspheres fracture and they break, whereas the um, plastic microspheres buckle. OK, so you've got these kind of two alternative regimes. You've got glass versus um, plastic microspheres. Um, so the nice thing about plastic microspheres is that they don't break, okay, so they, they mainly recover. So you see here, this is the stress strain plot again, and um, this is the unfilled and then increasing uh, numbers of uh, microspheres included in the material. So, you know, we haven't focused on the initial stiffness regime, but it's safe to say that adding microspheres makes the material initially stiffer. You do then get a subsequent softening. But the nice thing about it is that when you do the same test, you know, a week later, the stress strain curve is, is pretty much the same. You, you, you get slight differences for the sort of very, very highly filled materials because, you know, you'll inevitably have some sort of defects or, or whatever. Um, but this is huge strain, right? You know, this is very, very high strain. And therefore, this material is, is potentially very useful in terms of sort of uh, regimes in which it might be cycling. So, um, can reasons for this buckling, you know, the, the buckling of the microspheres be explained? So let's think about that. So what we did is we, we started on some sort of regime of, of imaging. This is sort of leading into what we're doing in terms of Henry Mosley and, and what we've done in there. Um, and so we, we took one of the microsphere composites and basically put it in a Devon compression rig and then imaged it. So under 0%, and then we go to 10%, sorry, 5%. So it's quite hard to see what's going on here, but it's best to focus on kind of this regime here. So you've got like a cluster of microspheres that are sort of close together. So you see this here, I'll leave my pointer here so you can have see it. You compress to 5%, okay, not much has happened. Then 10%, you're starting to see these now, you know, sort of becoming elongated and spheroidal. And then 20%, okay, some of them have sort of popped there. One seems to have disappeared completely. And then so 20% and then at 40%, you know, there's nothing left. Okay, so that's the sort of densification region. Okay, there's, there's a few up here that, that look like, you know, very, very flat pancakes. Um, so this is interesting. It's an interesting visualization of what's going on under load. But, um, you know, we can't really take much scientifically from this because we need to actually resolve what's going on in specific shells. So the question is, how do microspheres buckle? OK, and you can solve this problem mathematically. In fact, it's sort of quite a classical mechanics problem. You, know, you just put a thin shell in a matrix and then look at how it compresses under load. Um, but hardly anything was done on this. Um, there's been a, a little bit of work, but not that much, really. And, and it's interesting because, you know, the problem of buckling is a pretty classical one. You know, think of a, getting a Coke can and compressing it. That's a buckling problem, right? Um, but the interesting thing is that when you do that, then the buckling happens at the poles. You know, if you push down, then obviously the buckling is going to happen here because that's where you're pushing. Um, and the interesting thing is, is that this, the opposite thing happens for these kind of microspheres where you tend to get buckling at the equator. OK, so we did some maths and figured out that the shell thickness to radius ratio is pretty important, OK, as you'd imagine. And also the stiffness of the shell over the stiffness of the matrix is the other parameter that's important. And you can predict the sort of buckling pressure 
as a function of those two parameters. And then you can predict your kind of buckling mode. OK, so whether it's either equatorial buckling, as we call it, you know, the forces coming from the, the top here, it's uniaxial compression or it's kind of all shell buckling. OK, so the clear, the important thing here, here is to sort of try to understand what's going on. So what we did, because it's quite hard to do something with a microsphere because they're, you know, sort of tens of um, micrometers in size. So we basically took a ping pong ball and put it in a in uh, some different types of matrices um, and then just put it under compression. And then we tried to do the same thing for a microsphere, which was much harder, I can tell you. Um, but for a table tennis ball, we obtained this really, I was so happy when we obtained this image. It, it doesn't seem particularly difficult to do, but I can tell you it was extremely difficult. So you find this really lovely kind of creasing around the equator um, and that kind of predicts, um, sorry, proves what the theory suggests would happen. So, you know, what you can do is you can go and do a whole load of different types of table tennis balls. And this plot here shows the sort of parametric regime where you've got the um, shell stiffness to the matrix stiffness and the uh, shell thickness over the radius. So down here, you've got kind of equatorial dominated buckling. OK, so it looks like sort of this sort of thing here, whereas up here you've got all shell buckling. So the buckling sort of goes, you know, wraps around the whole shell. And so for this type of um, table tennis ball here, it, it's sort of more all shell. It's not clear. Obviously, the world life's not perfect, so you don't get perfect agreement. Um, but but in this kind of case here, you're kind of closer to the equatorial case, so things look a bit more um, sensible. So the thing is, the macroscopic case worked out okay, but the microscopic case was a lot harder. Um, and really, you can't tell anything from these images, right? You know, you can sort of we kidded ourselves often into thinking, oh yeah, this is this is buckling here, but then you sort of rotate it, and and anything could really be happening. So. Um, so although, you know, we had some success here, then we've got funding to go and do some uh, further imaging in Soleil, where we're going to actually do some, uh, some much more high resolution uh, images of, of single microspheres embedded in, in polymer matrices. OK, so but that kind of proves the point that what's going on is buckling. And, and it's sort of a nice illustration of, of the power of imaging in the sense that, um, you know, we're almost there in terms of the the buckling of the microspheres, but not quite. We're, we're at the, the limits of what's possible um, with what we've got available. Um, but thinking from a materials modeling perspective now um, and how we can use imaging to, to give us some sort of characterization of the materials that we're, we're thinking about, then um, if you just try to do materials modeling phenomenologically, so you, know, you, you just write down stress strain um, relationships in terms of um, what are called strain energy functions, um, then you can do okay, you know, but these kind of Ogden strain energy functions, which people use, they're okay in the regime in which you fit, but then you go outside that and they're completely hopeless. Okay, so um, that's not particularly great because that's often where you want to use your model, right? What's the point of a model if you can only fit in, in the regime in which you have data? So um, a, a next best step is then to think about microstructural models. So can you incorporate aspects of the microstructure into some sort of model that you can then develop a stress strain or constitutive model for. And so that's what we did back in 2013. So I'm not going to go through this in detail, but essentially there was a sort of microstructural model that incorporated microspheres and there was a regime in which there was sort of pre-buckling, um, buckling and post-buckling for the microspheres. Okay, so you've got a distribution, a polydispersed distribution of microspheres, and then as you load, you sort of keep track of which microspheres are not buckled and which are buckled. And that gives you a kind of softening regime. Um, and this is sort of the, the wrong way around. You normally have pressure on the vertical axis, but at that stage in our lives, we didn't for some reason. So you see this kind of softening effect as you increase the, the pressure. And that's essentially exactly what's happening. So initially the, the composite is stiff and then you get the softening as the successive microspheres are um, buckling. Okay, so in that world, then, Pretty much we didn't know anything about the actual microstructural features. So um, we had some manufacturers, uh, ranges for diameter distributions. We didn't know shell thicknesses. We didn't know microsphere mechanical properties. We had an estimation from a paper of the Young's modulus, and that was it. So what we did is we set about addressing that issue um, in this deficiency and parameter estimation. We went wholesale, you know, diameter distribution, uh, characterization, 
um, with the imaging facilities available. We were able to pick up things like anomalies due to air bubbles and clustering of microspheres and that sort of thing. Um, and in particular, we're interested in sort of two different types of grades of these thermoplastic microspheres. And what we were able to do is, um, is measure the diameter distribution, right? We, we got this sort of really nice fit to, to the number weighted frequency and then for the two different grades. And then we went away and said, okay, so the means are 21.4 for the microns for the 551 grade and 36.8 for the 920 grade. And this didn't correspond at all to what the manufacturers told us, right? They're way outside. So we spent a few weeks worrying about this and then realized that the manufacturers were using volume weighted frequencies, okay, rather than number weighted. And this is standard in particle sizing for, I don't know what reason, maybe somebody's got a reason that they can tell me, but anyway, so when we went away and did the volume weighting, then the numbers fitted exactly into the, what the manufacturers are telling us. But of course, although the manufacturers had these estimates of the range, then they didn't have the distributions of the microspheres. And that's really important in terms of modeling because you want to incorporate that poly dispersed distribution into your microstructural model for the um, mechanical property estimations. Okay, so what about shell thickness? Well, so Tim alluded to, to FIB and FIB was a revelation to me. I thought this was absolutely amazing. So when Matt Kurd showed me these images initially, you know, it, to me, it looked like something from as a film alien or something. I thought it was absolutely incredible. Um, so essentially, yeah, we, we sort of strip away the surface, um, rotate the, the, the microsphere, which is sort of on the end of a, of a pin essentially. And then we can measure the shell thickness here um, by SEM. And so we did that both with SEM and with radiography. Um, but the interesting thing is that although the assumption in the past has been that the shell thickness would be bigger for larger diameter shell, shells, then it turns out for all of the cases we did, there was no correlation whatsoever between the shell thickness and the diameter. So that's interesting. And it, it tells us something about um, the original assumptions that pe people were making. So we measured a sort of average shell thickness of 290 nanometers for the uh, 920 grade of the uh, microspheres. And then finally, what we did is we used some um, linear elastic homogenization methods or micromechanics methods, um, incorporated the polydispersed microsphere distributions, and then fitted that to the experimental data that we had um, to back out the mechanical properties of the shells. Okay, And, and it turns out that the previous estimate of three gigapascals that somebody came up with was actually an error. They actually measured the, the duct wall of the, the um, experimental kit that they were measuring rather than the mechanical stiffness of the, the shell. And so we obtained this kind of estimate of the uh, Young's modulus and Poisson ratio of the shell by virtue of having this experimental data and the imaging. Okay, so essentially the microsphere properties of this 920 grade are now, as a result of the work that we've done in terms of imaging, are now fully characterized. We've got the diameter, shell thicknesses, mechanical properties, um, and then we've done some follow-up work where we've estimated the average thickness of the 551 grade. Okay, so what's the next steps? Um, essentially, the point is that thermoplastic microsphere syntactic foams are more robust than cyclic loading than glass and also than the pure matrix. So if you think about the pure matrix, you, you cycle that material and it breaks. Syntactic foam, on the other hand, 40% filler, you get this wonderful stress strain behavior, very, very repeatable. So how can you characterize this and or optimize this? And how can you um, give multifunctional behavior? In particular, can we stiffen things? So the key thing is that thermoplastic microspheres are softer than glass. Um, and that leads to this kind of softening effect, even though you have this uh, sort of reproducibility. So can you use nano fillers to help there? So we're doing that at the moment. And then the other thing is, can we use machine learning techniques to optimize things? So the key thing is that, as is often the case with composites, then, you know, people take things off the shelf. Okay, they've got a bag of tricks and they use that bag of tricks and they mix them. Um, but the fact that we've got these two grades, you know, why did we end up with two grades? It was probably some random reason that, some person in a lab made these two grades at one point in time, but there probably are better um, mechanical properties that can result from different distributions of shell thicknesses, et cetera. So uh, the key thing to me is, you know, can we have some sort of physics driven machine learning? In particular, in this context, then actually collecting experimental data is expensive. So as Tim talked about in terms of both data and, and people time, um, but can we use the sort of materials modeling to fill parameter space 
in some sense, and then employ machine learning techniques to find optimized or interesting areas of parameter space that we wouldn't have originally found, you know, or can machine learning tell us where these interesting areas could be? Okay, so we've got a sort of proof of concept project to explore that. I'm not a data scientist, so I don't know much about machine learning at all. So if anybody wants to sort of get involved in that project or suggest ways forwards, then I'd be very keen to hear from you. So other things where we're going to be using imaging in the near future is um, the development of these things called neutral inclusions. So stress concentration, as everybody knows, is important. This is the comet aircraft, window, failure, and composites. You often get stress concentrations as well. Um, so these things called neutral inclusions are important because you can put coatings on inclusions. And as a result of those coatings, you can reduce the stress concentration. So here, for example, you know, you've got a void and then a void with a coating. Um, and in this case, these are kind of uh, stress contours, so to speak. And this is kind of perfect uniaxial compression here. And in particular, they also reduce stress concentration. So this, what we call a strong neutral inclusion here, this is the hoop stress along this red line. In the case where you, you have the strong neutral inclusion, then the stress is, is really significantly reduced compared to the sort of isolated void case here. So this is the sort of thing we want to be doing mechanically. And in particular, what we need to be able to do is look at the strains around the inclusions. So in order to do that, we need to use digital volume correlation for imaging. We're actually going to be using the sort of microspheres um, from syntactic foams as a tracer particle to image the strain. Um, and, and this is the sort of method to actually coat the inclusions with the uh, specific coatings that we need in order to induce this kind of neutral neutrality effect. So this is an EPSRC project that uh, we've just got funded in the last few months, and that's happening at the moment. Um, and that's pretty much all I wanted to say. I've obviously got to thank people, um, obviously thank the organisers today. Thank EPSRC for funding. Tellers, who've been great in terms of funding all sorts of different things that we've had over the last sort of two, two, uh, two decades. We've got lots of case studentship funding from them. They also fund um, these kind of smart hub research hubs. Um, obviously, Henry Mosley for the support that they've given to these projects. Um, and these are just a, a few of the papers that we published as a result of, of the work that we've done. Um, so thanks again. And